In 1972, ten years later, Iceland elected a left-wing government in favor of extending the fishery limit to 50 miles. Britain immediately took the dispute to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, while the trawlers and the Icelandic Coast Guard prepared for a second court war. We have, from the beginning, said that uh, we don't think the court has jurisdiction in this case, and we have let the court know, and the British government and the German government <coughs> know, that we do not uh, think this, these indications uh, <coughs> binding for Iceland in, every, in any way. Extension of the fishery limits to 50 miles is not based on our selfish interests, but on our responsibility for the rational utilization of fish stocks. The extension to 50 miles, of course, was uh, was greeted with, you know, a great deal of hostility. Again, it was seen that people were pushing out into into international waters, into in, in the, 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 the freedom of the sea was being challenged. The the, the whole potential future of vitality of this industry, which so many people relied, was being compromised. The court meets today to announce its decisions. The International Court of Justice ruled in Britain's favor. Iceland now had to rely solely on the Coast Guard and their small fleet of gunboats to protect the fishing grounds. I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to go to the ship and I was going to they make havens, one on the northwest coast of Iceland, one on the southeast coast. But uh, this haven time does restrict a man's ability to catch fish on his own. On the 1st of September 1972, the British fishing fleet set sail. In readiness for the Icelandic Coast Guard, the skippers had taken the precaution of painting over the trawlers' names and numbers. They also took pirate flags to hoist on entering the 50-mile limit. In the face of British determination to fish the waters, the Icelandic Prime Minister, Oliver Johannesson, permitted the Coast Guard to use their secret weapon, a trawl wire cutting device that had been developed towards the end of the 12-mile dispute. And this is just a Þá voru, voru við þarna að messa yfir mörðum að þeir mætti ekki vera þetta og þeir voru með þetta hefðbundna kjartaði við okkur og þá var allt einn heimilt að, að klippa. Það hafa strax stoppað að græna hóðnin og, og öskra bara hjálp og hjálp. Það hefði þarna allir flotinu. 
fyrstur er alveg sko, bara mállaus, undrandi. Þrólaus geti bara fara, bara, þeir skildu þetta ekki. Og það var náttúrulega allt brjálega, alveg allir flóti hann kom þarna sviklandi og ég held við voru eitthvað 20, 22 og þeir ætluðu bara að keyra okkur niður á staðinu og bara klára dæmi þarna og gerum þetta ekki aftur en það tókst nú ekki I think uh, the fishermen uh, and the owners felt that it was an extremely stupid uh, and very dangerous occupation and would almost inevitably lead to loss of life. Tilvillu var að þetta var skorið djúft og stæð langt mér í sjónum og teigjan sem var á vírunum, hún fór bara í sjóinn. Þannig að, að stundum vissum við ekki að við höfum klift fyrir að, að við sáum endan að koma upp hjá þeim og þeir vissu að ekki heldir, heldur. Well, when it recalls back, if the lads had been stood in the pounds, it would have just, well, it could have killed somebody quite easily. You know, it, it could cut them in half, it's as bad as that. Og þarna sáum við hvað við gátum gert, án þess að beita heldbundu vopnum, og án þess að breyta fengið færi á það að skjóta okkur með það, hérna, með þá ástæðu að hérna við hefðum byrjað vopnaburð, þetta var ekki vopnaburð. Þetta var bara heima til, tilbúið íslenskt ambóð, og átti ekki skilt við, við neinn hernaðatækni. And it's like a small nation against a big nation, what the hell else can we do? So they thought, well, chop him up and uh, we'll let the troll rounds in the pockets. I didn't go for it at the time, you know what I mean? If I had been the Icelanders, I'd done exactly the same, you know? If you don't want somebody on your doorstep, then do something to get them off it. Putting that gear back together again took 18 hours solid slug for all hands to rebuild that gear and put it back on the deck. And to their mind, it was 18 hours for nothing. They weren't getting paid for putting that gear back because it wasn't catching many fish. That was heartbreaking. Particularly after, by the time he got the gear rigged up and shot away, the fish had probably moved anyway. In addition to the ongoing cod war, British fishing was dealt another blow when the country opted to join the common market. The fisheries policy opened up Britain's own grounds to their new European partners. When Britain entered the common market as it then was, the European Economic Community in uh, 1972, uh, nobody bothered about fishing particularly because it was assumed that we would catch fish in Iceland. Uh, therefore, when they insisted that a condition of membership was that uh, fish should be treated as a common resource to which everybody should have equal access, it didn't particularly matter to the big owners, it mattered to the inshore fishermen. Then uh, suddenly people woke up with uh, horror, what's going to happen? Off Iceland, the Coast Guard's wire cutters were proving highly effective. By January 1973, the trawler skippers had had enough and threatened to leave the fishing grounds if they didn't get protection. But this time they did not want the Royal Navy to specify where they could go. Instead, they wanted the Royal Navy to follow them. I, I would think that we've no choice whatsoever uh, what we do about it. We can't fish here, it's impossible. We therefore have to leave, there is no choice of it. They're still out. Vegnir af flotanum. Og hótuðu því að þeir fæmund kæmu bara hei. Ef þetta er þessu heldi áfram og þeir fengi ekki meira aðstof frá ennsku stjórnvöldum. Vildum og herski, en fengu það ekki það sinn, en fengu það að drátta bóttan. Well, Lloydsman was a very powerfully built but slow ship. Uh, she, just as the gunboats were much tougher and had a thicker skin than we did, Lloydsman was tougher and had a much thicker skin than they did. And I don't think any of the gunboats thought that Lloydsman was a joke. And they come out with these oil rig ships, these tugs. I said, what do you think they're gonna do? In bad weather, Iceland. I said, what's the, the, what, what speed do they do? 10 knots. I said, you must be crackers. I said, 10 knots. I said, do you realize what the Icelandic gunboats seem like? How long was it there? Uh, these tugs and whatever we... That, that was the secret weapon. It was, uh, <coughs> it was the best laugh of all, I think. Remember, I saw the Coast Guard. 
I am requested to hold your ear. Dissatisfied with this ineffective protection from the wire cutters, the trawlers again threatened to leave the fishing grounds in May 1973. This would have been tantamount to surrender, so the Royal Navy returned to support the tugboats. Now, for the first time, we have got the unanimous support, support of the industry that the Navy should go in. This was one of the purposes of my visit to Hull on Thursday, to try and find out from the industry whether they would support, because I've always felt that unless the Navy had the full support of the industry, it would be very difficult for them to help, even if they did go in. The Icelandic did cut my troll ropes, three times to my knowledge. The only one time, it was in a, a stern fissure, a fresh fissure, but she was a stern fissure, the CS Forrester. Two, the British Coast Guard vessels. One had a, a liaison officer on board, a friend of mine, Mick Osborne. And I called Mick Osborne up, HMS, I forget the name of the ship. But I said, Mick, we have found a few fish marks. We've gone to shoot our troll. Can we have some protection? He said, yes. I speak to the captain. We shot the gear. And Mick Osborne, my friend, said to me, right, Dick, we are with the captain. One British gunboat will be tight on your port quarter. The other one will be tight on your starboard quarter. The uh, agar cannot get between us. He said, we guarantee. So we are fishing away. And I looked aft and I thought, the British gunboats are very close. You wouldn't get a cigarette paper between the two British gunboats. And the Agar circling ahead of us, he gave us the official warning. Well, I wanted to answer him and laugh, but I thought, no, that's too disrespectful. So I didn't say anything. And he started coming on my port side at full speed. I thought, crikey, there's got to be a collision. And as our gunboat, HMS, I forget his name, I'll call him HMS Useless. And he was tight on our port quarter. And as the Agar got down our port side, the British gunboat backed away to port. And he just circled us in one motion and bang, the explosive cutter went. And it chopped our port warp. So I called the captain of HMS Useless up. I said, what's this guarantee you give me? He said, you are terribly terrible. There would have been a collision. I said, yes, I know that. And the captain of the Odin knows that. I said, it's only you. I said, you should have stood your ground. You would have squeezed him in between me and you. Well, he said, we can't do that without permission from Whitehall. Oh. <laughs> Iceland's argument was for the conservation of the cod stocks, while Britain claimed historical rights to fish the waters. The <laughs> We believed that we had these rights for so long and that we were entitled to have them. And there was no sound explanation given as to why we shouldn't have them.